let's say, more easy to, to grasp. People might begin to understand. Okay? Which is, of course, the vindication of Gabriel Tarr. And I allude here to the reenactment that I did with Bruno Garcenti on the right playing Durkheim and myself playing Tarr. It's on my website. It's translated in English. And in Modernology and Sociology, which is soon to be translated in English, um, Tarr made the point I am going to make in a minute about Monad. So if you have followed the argument until here, it means that the discontinuity between the micro and macro is an artifact of a type of data and the type of navigation. It's the difficulty of navigating, which means that we put a lot of emphasis on the difference and the discontinuity between the micro and the macro. But now, if we sort of are used and begin to understand this experience of search, the two-way navigation is what we are used to, the two endpoints lose their privilege. There are lots of ways of assembling the whole, and there is no individual entities anymore. What counts is the green arrow here in this argument, if you bear with me. So what I'm going to do, and I'm sorry to make a point which is so technical in an assembly which is so large, and in a place which is more used to, uh, well, simpler things, not the word for church. <laughs> Let's say, uh, well, that's for <laughs> what I want to do is simply to relocate the usual distinction between micro and macro in a different experience of search. What is the experience? Well, we go from a dot. We don't know what we are looking for, we just have a proper name. Someone is coming to see us, I don't I just have a name. I Google it. What happens? Well, you begin to have a CV. Long, this is Google Scholar here, I'm sorry for the example again of Google. Again, I'm not paid by Google. <laughs> and the CV prof profile the person, and at some point, you stop the search and you do a little circle around. And you say, that's a substance, I know enough of this guy. Okay? So, you'll notice that when you do a CV, you're not doing something which is individual. It's not an individual, because the CV is made of a list of papers which are distributed collectively, of places, diploma, all sorts of other things which are collected. But you collect them in a way, which means that the more you know, the more attributes there is, the more bigger the network, the more individualized is the element. This paradox, which is not a paradox for actor network theory, but which was a paradox for every critique of actor network theory, which means probably lots of people in this room, and certainly <laughs> lots of people at the time. It's a paradox because people never realize that the more you individualize, the more you collectivize. Collecting is what individualizes. And this distance is not between micro and macro, it's just a distance between the dot at the beginning and the search when you stop the search. And here I suppose I stay inside a data set. I'm not talking about the limit of a data set would be another difficulty. So, the argument is that we are not saying this is the end of the distinction between micro and macro. We are saying the more we are used to this practice of digital navigation, the easier it is not to think in the term of a two-level standard. So, it's, it, we habituate ourselves to the possibility of looking at organization in a flat way. Of course, flat is a word which is disputed. And that's my third argument, which is how, what this argument about profile and navigation means to get the whole. Can we now look seriously at the common experience we always have, and yet which is never registered by the language we use, that the whole is smaller and not bigger than the part. Every one of us is infinitely bigger, made of many more parts than any of the institutional organization in which we enter. So that's my third point, which is in fact very easy to do now that we have this, if you have accepted the two other points. We've not accepted, but that is for the remnant of it reminder of this talk. Usually when people tackle this question, not in organization studies so much, but in social theory, especially when they are coming from physics,
physics or coming from mathematics, they want to model social phenomena, they say. And they start with atomic element, endowed with very, very little property. Think of Schilling's model of ghettoization. Then they list the smallest numbers of interacting rules, and then they let the computer do the job, and they obtain something which is they call emergent structures, whatever is the name. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar, there are dozens and dozens of these little uh, tests. And they say, you, the sociologist, or you, the qualitative social scientist, anthropologist, you don't know your business because you do things which are too complicated. You do interviews, you do description of real situation. This is too complicated. We start with very simple assumption, and we get a structure with very simple rules of interaction. Which means that they explain cues, traffic jams, and the order. Basically, that's what physics explains when you do this sort of phenomenon. Now, I'm asking you how, many, how much time do we spend in a whole life in the order? <laughs> and in a queue, well, maybe some like traffic jam, that's a bit more. Especially if you live in Los Angeles. But still, this is not what the social is ma massively made of. Right? There are endless numbers of phenomena which are not queues, which are not traffic jams, which are not order. Even though the order is very interesting, of course. So, the question is, can we absorb the phenomena where neither the notion of atomistic entity, nor interaction, nor structure are visible? And that's what I mean by reassembling, or reassembling organization. The three main elements, the individual, the interaction, and the whole, are artifacts of the way we handled that. That's my answer. It's a bit extreme. But it makes sense. So that there is no... I mean, it makes sense for me. Okay. And I've, actually, uh, being a preacher here means quite a lot. So I'm preaching, actually. Brothers well, and sisters, you need a real tone of voice to preach. I can't even it first. Just so that there is no difficulty here, don't confuse this argument with a return to the holistic argument, because in, in this view, which has been actor network theory for years, the distinction between the holistic and atomistic is completely moot, because in both cases, you have something I call a dispatcher, a sort of mythical entity, which is distributing worlds and functions. The atomistic people, the people who do these models like Schilling and so on, the people who are doing emergent structure, the people who do system theory, the people who do uh, sort of autopoietic systems and so on, in fact, always end up with a dispatcher. Even if they study swarms of, uh, of ants or flocks of birds or all that. But just the difference is that the dispatcher arrives after. And the holistic guys, the dispatcher, they start with and then they distribute individual roles. It makes absolutely no difference to my argument if you start with atomistic or if you start with the holistic. Because my argument is precisely that it's possible to get out of this trap in which organization studies and social theory more generally has been uh, captive, so to speak. We do an argument a bit too big. So let me give an example. 